So let me start with our talk, um, design for dementia. Now, I want to talk a little bit about this. I, I stole these, um, these persona here from a place where you can, you, can, you can make persona and you can buy them. And you can see here different types of people. They're very popular in marketing where we are designing for a persona. What is a persona? It's a cartoon. It isn't somebody who really exists, but it's an amalgamation of what we think is the person we are designing for. So this is really important to keep that in the back of your head when we're having this discussion. And I, I'd like to have this discussion then go into uh, the panel where we're further discussing this, because it's something that we started out with. We started out with persona for design. So one of um, how this came up was that we were working on the Chris and Sally house that you are working on in, in, in Watford. So we have four PhDs currently working uh, with that dementia house, working on developing dementia friendly guidelines. Ahmed is looking at the indoor environment, regulating that. Uh, and Ahmed and Manisha are looking at not um, developing cognitive stimulating tasks per se, uh, because I don't want to have them be banished to an island. Um, you know, they're really nice people and I quite like hanging out with them. Uh, so uh, instead, they are doing something which we found earlier to work quite well in a project list. Peel and I did together with Jordan Elliott King and worked with resistance bands, which could improve uh, physical performance. And Ahmed and Manisha are taking that further to uh, uh, develop that within the house. So this is where we're coming from. Now, when, what we found when we're designing, when we're designing this sort of technology or this home, a lot of the people we're working with aren't clinically trained at all. And um, so when we're working with architects and designers, it seemed to be quite pertinent to come up with a cartoon of the people we're designing for. Now, as Ahmed and Tom both brought to the front is it's really important and 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 lauren who i mistakenly called hall but it's actually we have two laurens which is way too difficult for my menopausal brain so mm -hmm. <laughs> lauren hall will come back later in the panel uh lauren just now talked about that not everybody likes to be spoken about in the same way, uh, not within the day, um, you know, I might be perfectly fine with being called Eve, and then when a call center calls me and goes like, hey Eve, I will bitchily say it's Dr. Hogerforst for you, uh, just because I don't like some random stranger calling me Eve. Um, so yeah, how we like to be addressed, how we like to be spoken to is in sharp contrast to these persona and it's something I felt quite uncomfortable with for a long time which is why this last meeting was organized and that becomes especially uncomfortable when we're talking about these unmet needs these behavioral and psychological symptoms associated with dementia these what we call challenging behaviors or even more unfriendly acting out so um this work was I'm, I'm representing the work by uh, 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 by my collaborators Sue Hignett with Charlie Case and currently with Catherine Peaks and uh, with a wonderful PhD student from Technical University in Delft called Gubing Wang who came to visit us uh, who worked together with uh, two of the staff there uh, Armagan and uh, Albrak and Tisha van der Kammer who uh, developed uh, all sorts of technology for people with uh, dementia and worked with us together on the NOMI tool, which I which we'll talk about a little bit. And then Leicestershire County Council, who we are currently still engaged with, to um, design uh, specialist dementia facilities and make sure we're getting the voice of the people we're designing for involved, because that's something that came up very clearly what is the voice? What is the preference? How do we capture that? How do we design for the people we are designing for and with? So this um, slide was earlier shown uh, in a very similar fashion by Tom. Obviously, we have the cognitive issues. 
um, Ahmed talked about gait and visual changes, and uh, Maria talked about hearing loss and other issues. Dahlia talked about hearing loss, both as risk factors, but also as factors which make testing and engaging with people with dementia even more difficult than just the cognitive issues we're thinking about per se. Now that can lead to frustration. If you're not hearing what somebody's saying to you and people keep on talking to you, or maybe like for instance, Lauren just said speaking louder or, or you know, patronizing you like, hey granny, hello, you know, that would lead to a lot of frustration. You could see that people would then become aggressive. So quite a lot of these behavioral changes perhaps might be much more logical if we look at them from the person with dementia's point of view. Um, but as, as Tom said, these issues, these behavioral and psychological changes do impact on the carer in different ways. And of course, carer stress and earlier institutionalization. So is there something we can do? Can we have design solutions to work with this? But then how, if we're working with designers, how can we illustrate the issues that we see? Now, there are various solutions to this. And Charlotte Chase was a wonderful PhD student working with myself and Sue Hignett. Um, developing dementia persona. And what uh, Charlotte did was she did a scoping survey. She sent out questionnaires to 113 participants from uh, who were people working care homes, who were carers, um, who were GPs, uh, specialists. And uh, we asked them to come up with um, these persona, we did various activities afterwards, interviews, focus groups, um, to talk about design considerations, design priorities, solutions, and the need for the use of persona that became more and more clear. And so we, uh, we or rather Charlotte did all the hard work, she came up with these personas, we discussed them, we tested them, and uh, then Charlotte went to care homes to um, uh, talk about this testing of the content and the format of the personas and how well they worked for people. So whether people recognized them, whether they were valuable, whether they added to the identification of groups of people. Are we able to cluster groups of people together? Now, the persona clustering was in terms of severity of the presentation. Okay, so we have a different presentation and severity from uh, mild to moderate to severe. And so this is how the persona were structured. But most importantly, with the persona, we wanted to um, signify to designers and architects, people who have worked less with people with dementia, that there is an enormous variability both within people as well as between people. Now, this is very important for the within difference. Um, and we can see that here, Charlotte came up with a brilliant design solution um, where the green area, so, so she had a, a two, um, uh, two, two circles with a bit cut out, and you could turn these to signify how uh, there are good days within a particular person, perhaps with mild dementia, and how there are bad or average days. And uh, we gave these people, um, uh, the, I have more information on the web. If you're interested in this, please, please ask me, but in the interest of time, I won't go into too deeply, but we had five persona, Alison, Barry, Chris, um, Chris and Sally, who lived together, Christine, who lived by herself, who were in the sort of moderate uh, severity, and then David, who was sort of end stage severe dementia category. Um, and we gave these people a little story. These people were also, we used actors to film what they would be like to visualize how that would look, how that, what, what these presentations would look like. And uh, for instance, Alison, very mild dementia. She was widowed, no children, but she has a younger sister who lives in Australia. They catch up once a month via Skype. 
She enjoys reading, dancing, and going out for meals with friends, and she worked in a shop before retirement and enjoyed chatting to customers. So this is quite somebody who's quite sociable, who likes social contacts. Now, on a good day, we can see that there are very few issues. There's only mild dementia. Uh, she needs very little help um, getting on, and she uh, is quite independent in her activities. But on a bad day, there is an increased risk of falls. We talked in the second meeting about that increased risk of falls in dementia and it worsens the dementia the risk is doubled with dementia it worsens the risk because the reflexes often go so people end up falling and hitting their heads which accelerate the dementia process on a bad day Alison finds it quite difficult to organize herself a plan and you could see that for instance in her having more difficulties organizing dinners and complex shopping. She needs extra time during conversations to find the right words. And you notice in the conversation, word finding problems, um, sort of noticeable short-term memory problems. Like she'll say, oh, I, I can't quite remember what I had for breakfast now, you know. It's not that important, but you're beginning to think, yeah. Um, and a lot of, oh, the thingy, the, the thingy, oh, the what's -a call it. That sort of stuff comes in. That's sort of perhaps typical. Tom, would you recognize that as something typically I'm asking here, the main expert? Yeah, he yeah. nods, he says yes. So um, these uh, symptoms and care needs and design needs are all covered here within this, um, within this sort of little rotating. Um, um, it, it is. It's, I, I love it. And it was so clever of Charlotte to come up with this. It's really smart. So the two overlap and uh, they're super, super smart. Um, so um, it also has some assessment scores uh, to clarify where people would be at and uh, some personal information. So this is very important because it helps account for needs and symptoms in people with dementia to show People with dementia can show quite a varied profile where people often in the morning can, when you're testing them, can still, still seem quite all right at this stage. By the afternoon, by the evening, when people are getting more fatigued or if, when people have had more stress, you can see the bad um, day symptoms coming to the front. Um, so these pieces fit together and they can rotate to reveal these different sections so people can play around with that to get an insight in how they are. So this was done for all uh, five of them and was uh, made a little bit more attractive. Even Charlotte did a fantastic job. So this was a combined project. We all have all these multidisciplinary projects between the design school. Uh, Sue is a professor of ergonomics and hospital care. And, and I know a little bit about dementia. So together we came up with Charlotte with this idea, which is great. Um, now, this is Christine. So uh, we're skipping very going to moderate dementia here. And Christine was married, um, uh, but uh, she now lives alone. Um, she has one daughter who lives nearby. She used to work as a psychology lecturer, is very interested in people, but sometimes she's quite happy to sit and people watch. She likes playing music. Uh, but she's also used hearing aids. Now with Christine, you want to make sure that she's wearing the hearing aids when you are testing her, when you're communicating, because she will forget to put them in. And Maria's work has very clearly shown the devastating effect when people, even in people wearing, wearing hearing aids, when you're testing them. So um, Chris and Sally, we were asked to develop because um, these were designed for people who are still living in their own homes. And uh, Chris and Sally, we made videos as well to show how that worked, how these dynamics worked within good and bad days. And because this was a diet, Sally, the caregiver, was also given her persona for a good 
a bat on an average day. And it shows that dynamic within the couple um, to alert designers to that, that if you're working with people with dementia at this stage, you will have the caregiver involved as well, who will also be giving their two pens to that design to what they want the design to do, perhaps overruling what the person with dementia wants themselves. So this is one of the videos, uh, you can watch it here. The actors were amazing, they were really amazing. We had funding from the Loughborough alumni who were very moved uh, by these, these films. I, I definitely suggest you give it a watch. Um, and this is, uh, you can't really see it very well because it's in the dark. Uh, Chris is getting up at night, he's doing night wandering, which is causing Sally a lot of distress and a lot of sleepless nights with irritability and irritation. We were subsequently asked by uh, Leicestershire County Council to look a little bit more at these unmet needs. So Leicestershire County Council was really interested in uh, designing specialist dementia facilities, for people with what they called were three persona. And we're now investigating in more detail. So this was bottom up. So this was not imposed to them by us. This came bottom up from care providers. But it said the biggest issues lie here with three levels of care needs, where the top one requires the most care needs and is the most difficult to place. And these are often older men who show disinhibition, uh, can be very aggressive and sexually disinhibited and are physically strong and mobile. So you need high uh, staffing levels. You need sometimes three to one, sometimes five to one to uh, if somebody starts acting out to engage with them. Um, then uh, there was another uh, care level, um, a persona uh, of somebody who wants to go home, um, who, who, who wanders around a lot, who is anxious, uh, depressed, very agitated, and who needs a lot of reassurance, but it doesn't always help. Um, people just want to go home and, and, and are very, very distressed. And um, according to some of the caregivers, the first two levels would not have a lot of design solutions. So these were care providers who said, well, those first two don't have a lot of design solutions, except for number two. And this was a design solution which I'd seen in India uh, many years ago. I worked a lot in India and Indonesia. And the lovely thing there is, is that with very low cost, people come up with quite effective solutions. So people see something and introduce it. And one of the things that introduced, which baffled me a little bit in uh, Bangalore, in uh, the Nightingale home, was a bus stop. And they've also got one in Leicestershire here. So you have a walled garden and in it is a bus stop. Now, uh, people who are agitated were told, OK, we, we, we can take you. You will we'll go to the bus stop, you know, if nothing helped, go to the bus stop sit down and say, like, well, well, just have to wait, um, if you don't mind, and then let somebody wait there pleasantly in this covered bus stop, looking at the garden. And very soon, because this was a lovely garden with lots of birds and activities and people wandering around with meandering paths, people would forget all about needing to go home and we'd just sit there and have lovely chats. Now, the ethics there can be much debated. I mean, what do you like putting somebody at a bus stop with a bus which is never going to arrive? Now, in my own experience in India, this happened quite a lot in the 90s where buses never arrived. So I don't know. But in Leicestershire, well, these days, probably buses don't arrive in Leicestershire either. But uh, <laughs> let's keep away from all these political discussions. So um, anyway, um, is there an ethical um, issue there? Yes, there is. But there's also an ethical issue with giving people, for instance, benzodiazepines, as Tom talked about, because A, the efficacy of these is limited, and B, they increase the risk for falls. So, tricky one. Um, people, the third level of um, caregiving, according to the care providers, where people were confused, uh, disoriented, fluctuating attention sounds a little bit like a delirium. 
perhaps uh, or and or had apathy. I found uh, it was really interesting. Delirium often wasn't recognized by care providers. Is, is that something you've come across, Tom, as well? well it, yeah, it can be missed. I mean, delirium can be either kind of hyperactive, like yes. people are sort of jumping around and lashing out and so forth. That's, um, but it can also be hyperactive, yes. in which case it's very easy to have it. Yes. just go very quiet. Yeah, and then there is that apathy that you talked yeah. about, the people sitting by themselves, perhaps seeing things that aren't there, but they're kind of left to their devices because they almost don't require care, do they? Yeah. Now, um, if it is a delirium, that's obviously very dangerous. It's a life-threatening um, situation. If it's apathy of another nature, um, a lot of the care providers said, yeah, well, that's something you can work with, like you can look at um medication are people given too much medication are they dehydrated are they um in pain which is something uh, that christian morgner talked about uh, so you need to see what the background is between this hyperactivity or hypoactivity um i i had a discussion with somebody about urinary tract infections um People often think, and I used to think that this is a big driver in uh, delirium. It's actually been shown that it's not quite as common as people think it is. And then people are described antibiotics with all the effects on the gastrointestinal system, etc. cetera. Um, yeah, anyway, but looking at people's medical status is important and particularly looking at over-medication because it very often happens, polypharmacy. It's a risk factor for falls. It's a risk factor for delirium. So these three levels of care needs, we, uh, uh, Catherine Peaks further interviewed, so we incorporated them in the dementia persona we had. Now talking at that mild to moderate level, and we now added some, uh, uh, Christine was already wanting to sort of walk around quite a bit. Uh, we invented a, persona for the first one we didn't have yet and called him Carl and Carl was a former rugby player who uh, exhibited uh, aggressive outbursts but could also you know which which were unprovoked uh, and and could be quite um, difficult to work with and difficult to place and this is something that Leicestershire County Council really had an issue with. So we asked uh, our, our Leicestershire County Council task force whether there were particular groups of people, clusters or challenging behaviours and people really didn't like, and I was happy to hear it, didn't like the term acting out, which is good. Um, people said that they could definitely recognize these three personas within the care home and uh, that they were very difficult to find places for um, certainly for somebody like Carl with the disinhibition uh, very often people given medication locked away in a room um, and people uh, the task force was quite distressed about that so they really wanted us to come up with solutions for this behavior um, so these were some more of the comments, how, what, what sort of a challenge that was. And with COVID, of course, it's becoming a particularly pressing issues with uh, people being in care homes, but also being, being stuck there, being stuck inside, uh, having to look at caregivers with masks and so on. Um, sometimes uh, one, one of the really, and this is why it's so useful to work with the care providers and the carers to constantly get that feedback from on the work that we're doing is that the behavior, some of the behaviors are very constant and that was really difficult to deal with, very wearing on the staff, leading to a lot of staff turnover. Um, so the solutions that were named were, uh, well, I'll, I'll mention solution number one was we need more staff. There's an enormous staff turnover, and this is caused by cuts to healthcare. I'm going political again. I'm going to stop that right now. Um, anyway, so we just need to pay people better salaries and give them better work conditions. That is the main issue. But if we're not going to do that, there are other things that we can think about from a design perspective, and that is good natural light, making sure that there are, uh, and I've mentioned that with the windows, there need to be big windows, 
preferably looking onto green spaces, having space, not being cramped in. Uh, what tends to be done in a lot of care homes is you have little rooms, sort of, because people are easier to sort of um, heard into and heard out in. Uh, in France, uh, we're currently writing a book with uh, Interdem about dementia design. In France, they're using more and more an open space where people can move from the dining area to a craft area to a sitting quietly together area. And people can just fluidly move in that space. So they're not wandering about in, in a care home looking for where something is, but it's all there. The main issue there is noise, of course, but um, would have been thought to be the noise. But our French colleague said, actually, when people are happy doing what they do, there isn't any excess noise. It's people start chattering and screaming and you know, becoming restless if they're frustrated. Um, for uh, Carl, people said making sure there's no glass that's breakable, clutter, loose objects, because they can be hurled around. Um, and here and again lies that design challenge of having fixed chairs or these horrible chairs. We've all tried to sit in them and pose ourselves in them, which are glued and hammered to the ground and are absolutely more. It, it, it enrages me always. There's a small increase in cortisol where you're trying to move a chair back and you can't, you don't have to put yourself kind of in it. Um, so there is again a tension there, but obviously you also don't want to have chairs flying through uh, the space. So it needs to be very sensitively sort of organized. Um, music has been found to be very therapeutic for these uh, unmet needs. But again, that's personalized. Uh, whereas one person can completely chill out with ACDC, other people like myself would perhaps prefer, I don't know, a nice Beethoven, Monshine Mon Sonata, for instance. So again, you need to work with people, preferably before the dementia has progressed to make playlists, to have Alexa play this. Another issue, which I discovered myself, talking to my phone because my radio had failed in the car, and asking him to play it, and I couldn't come up with the name of my favorite pop star. So there I'm sitting and going like, uh, Siri, it's like, na, 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 na. And Siri's girl, I don't know what your na, 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 na is, and you don't have it on your playlist either. Uh, again, there is software for this, um, for the recognition of, of, of sounds and themes. So we can use that again in the background, like Alexa, like the work that Sal and his group do to help support people in that. Um, having outside spaces was mentioned as a really good idea. Um, obviously, we're in England, so we need to make sure that people have somewhere to um, you know, walk under, perhaps, if it's outside, but to allow people to do gardening, to walk around freely, which is a pretty green space, flowers for sensory stimulation, et cetera. Um, and then that bus stop, purposeful walking, I talked about. So um, Lauren already talked about Kit Woods model, so I'm not going to be talking about that too much. But um, this is the opposite of the persona, which is the personalized, which very much talks about individuality, independence, privacy working with people together, giving people choice, making sure they have, they maintain their dignity, that you have respect and you are aware of people's rights. So um, Kidwood talked about these, these, these ways, these solutions of providing that, and we all need attachment. We want to be loved by people. We want to be comforted. We want to be seen as a person. Um, by being included in groups or excluded if we should so choose to, and by doing something to occupy ourselves, whatever that is, and that is meaningful for us. And um, Gubing Wang developed this Nomi toolkit, which is a really sweet, Gubing Wang was another PhD student we had the pleasure of working with. She helped us co-design the ACTI chair. Uh, I talked about the ACTI chair before, so I'm not going to talk about that again. But Gubin did a wonderful um, thing that's online. It's called the Person-Centered Canvas, where she fed K 
capabilities of people into data and go design guides. And it looked something like this, considering the time, I'm probably not going to be able to go into that too deeply. But she talked about capability cards to make sure that people were aware of um, the sensory capabilities, so much sensory, the visual changes, to ask yourself, you know, are the visual changes, are the auditory changes we all talked about so much, which is so important in the second session, all factory. Uh, we can develop um, sensory gardens with smell, but smell is one of the functions to go in dementia and is actually often used as a risk factor to reduce smell, the ability to smell lavender. Lavender is an incredibly strong smell, but it goes in dementia. So yes, it's horrible. And um, then uh, it talks about uh, the cognitive uh, abilities, uh, thinking about memory issues, executive uh, control, attention. So these cards really help people who don't know anything about dementia to alert them to what sort of questions they should ask about the capability. And then the motor issues, the balance, the locomotion, the muscular strength and the movement speed. So can people actually get around the space? Do they need wheelchair access? Now, these days, of course, as Barbara would have told you, who looks at guidelines, all buildings these days have to um, take into account part M for the building regs. You have to design for people with wheelchair disability. We're trying to make people think about part M plus, where we're also looking at these cognitive elements and these unmet needs we see in people with learning disability and we see in people with dementia. So this is the co-design um, guide uh, Gubing has put on uh, the web. If you're interested in that, go and have a look. It's a really good piece of software and uh, a data collection format she's also put in. So this is a very systematic way of helping designers collect data that they need to co-design together uh, with people with dementia. And that ultimately comes up with a person-centered canvas. And that person-centered canvas was developed from the need-driven dementia compromised behavior model, which is a wonderful model, which really looks at the needs of people with dementia themselves. And the non-pharmacological interventions we talked about, like music therapy, aromatherapy is often seen to help but then of course if the olfactory system is compromised you can't um technologically assisted therapy um in holland they have something called the tover tafel for instance which is a table with lights and you play with that and it's very intuitive it's a lot of fun there's lights and sounds people really enjoy doing that um and uh so this brings together life history these needs behaviors, non pharmacological interventions that work for this person, the capability insights, interaction insights. So, for somebody with Carl, what seems to trigger off? Is, are there any triggers that seem to push people into um, these unmet needs behaviors? And then data insights. So, um, that was established using three design approaches. So, ergonomics, looking at limitations in aging, as Tom said, we should make sure that uh, we design for people, for all the people in general. It's not just people with dementia, but much applies, um, such as a reduced grip strength, for instance, or a reduced um, ability to get up quickly, co designing, and data enabled design. So, making sure that the data actually feed into design that you do that in a systematic way. So she's done that really well. It's a lovely uh, model. And this is sort of the opposite of the persona. This really works from people you're designing for. Now, again, that of course has, and this would be a person-centered uh, canvas for care staff, which could be filled in. Uh, so uh, this is a very quick sort of tick box where you're looking at life history, the needs, behaviors, data about me. And that is very important because if you're working with uh, 
very diverse groups, there are people who for religious or cultural reasons uh, have, will have issues with the types of implementations. You know, if you'd have a sauna and all of people be like, yay, gets off all together, let's go. Uh, when I tried this with my English partner, yes, Dom, um, he went, what? Excuse me, I'm, I, you want me to, we're, we're all nude? And, and, and this is like mixed, it's like, yeah, yeah, that's what we do in Holland. So again, you know, where you're designing a care home in Holland versus a care home in um, England, that would be a very different issue. You must be aware of what um, pet therapy, the same uh, for uh, Muslim people, dogs are not um, clean animals. So if you're doing pet therapy, you can't come and bring in your German shepherd because that would perhaps cause issues. So we need to be sensitive to the cultural backgrounds of people and um, where they're coming from and what they can do or can't do or don't want to do. Uh, I like what it says here about the opportunities. What can I do independently? What can I do with a little help? And which opportunities are open for me? And that's a very positive approach to rather than to look at limitations is to say, what can somebody do? Can people still talk about the olden days? Can people do reminiscent therapy? What do I have difficulties with? And this is again, this is very much about that capability. Uh, what applies to me? Uh, this is about false risk here. And then the therapies that works. New Zealand therapy, for instance, we talked about in the first uh, meeting uh, where you have a, a room, a sensory room uh, with soft furnishings, music, smells, uh, which can be used to calm people down. Um, and then there's robot therapy, positive image, simulated presence, etc. So there's lots of things that have been uh, looked at. The evidence base for this is somewhat limited, but I think from the meta-analysis we see is music therapy helps massage, but again, you have to be so careful with this because not everybody likes that. Um, and aromatherapy has been shown to have some benefits as well, animal therapy to some extent, but again, you have these cultural influences. Tovatafel in general in care homes has shown really good beneficial effects. Um, this was another uh, model that we've come up with, working um, again uh, with um, carers from the person-centered point of view, kind of bringing all of this together, uh, where we try to connect uh, carers, because the carers um, in, in homes, the staff often changes, and we want to develop something that people can use very quickly. So this is less adapt for design, but this goes more towards the care element of um, things. So we're looking here at quick ways to enter a few words or click some buttons. We're, we're currently uh, trailing this with staff to see what work for them. And on this side, we're getting input from the family. So seeing where people come from, what was their education, their life history, is there any neurodiversity? Um, autism, ADHD, perhaps this lecture is often overlooked. So you might give somebody a book, but they have this lecture. So you need to adapt that. Uh, you need to be aware of this. The previous jobs and interests and hobbies, the no-nos, um, is there any trauma, anything that could trigger the trauma, um, anything religion and culture we talked about, and how much contact or stimulation do people need? Um, extroverts need a lot of input, they need other people, introverts don't really do that at all. They prefer to sit home and read books, they don't like all that stimulation. So you need to ask people where they sit. Here are uh, inputs from neuropsychologists uh, where you uh, look at communication and semantic dimensions where people have word finding issues or perhaps the aphasias. We just heard Bruce Willis uh, has aphasia, which means he has word. Um, I, I don't know which aphasia he has. Did you see it this morning? I saw it. You can either have receptive aphasia where you don't uh, recognize the words 
or you can have productive aphasia where you can't pronounce the words. Um, so that obviously is going to impact on how you relate to people. Um, check hearing, vision, teeth, um, very important. The memory is there, episodic memory, can people still learn new things? Can they still talk about the past semantic memory facts? Uh, what about false risk? What is their balance like? Uh, their autostatic hypertension, their strength. Um, do they have uh, needs for activities of daily living, for more complicated activities? And then from, so this comes from the uh, neurologists and the OTs, and this would come from psychiatrists, the extent to which there is disinhibition, risk for delirium, um, check for depression always, as Tom said, very common in dementia, a logical reaction to the diagnosis early in the dementia. It's a risk factor for dementia, commonly seen in strokes, which occur in dementia and uh, can respond uh, depending on uh, the origin well to CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, if that's still possible at that stage or uh, medication. And here is medical issues, things you need to be aware of. Um, for instance, older people often forget to drink and they lose their sense of thirst. And that can really compound to confusion and memory issues. Uh, forget to eat as well, which uh, in care homes where they looked at that, where they really made an issue of um, um, making sure that people ate and drank at regular intervals, memory performance was improved. So this could be a quick checklist um, with colors uh, for, to quickly flag up to people so data would be entered together with people with dementia and their, friend, uh, their friends and families and other medical staff um, who had seen them. And for instance, here, if this person would have hearing issues, you'd be very quickly alert to that. So it would allow new staff to quickly think, hang on, I need to check that. I need to check where that person is. This person might have uh, frequent urinary tract infections, which you need to be aware of. Uh, needs is, is uh, often incontinent, so needs help with that. You need to be aware of that and has issues learning new information, but on the other hand, is still physically very strong. There are no known issues with any of the other, other uh, aspects, so you could perhaps be aware of those that are and those that are not. So when we're co-designing, uh, I talked a bit about the walking and talking, which was a really good way of um, walking around with people with dementia. I think Liz, well, Liz is an expert on that area, so I won't say too much about it. But um, we found we got a lot of information uh, out from um, the people we, we, we walked around with, Jordan walked around with, on, for instance, barriers to exercising. And um, it's very daunting to sit at a table opposite to somebody who goes, right, okay, you tell me, do you like exercise, Tom? And you would go like, uh, uh, I don't know, you know, who are you, the doctor? But whereas if you're walking around and you're relaxed, there's a lot more that comes out. We used for the co-design of the chair emoji. So happy faces versus unhappy faces where people could point to if they liked um, the design. And then Saul talked a lot about his uh, videoing of people in an anonymous fashion, which I hope will be discussed in the panel. So um, the discussion is persona can be useful. They can help provide insight to people who haven't worked with people with dementia before. But when we talk to people with dementia about the persona, they said they often felt quite stigmatized and patronized by it. I wouldn't like to have a persona, an Eve persona, like some crazy professor with long unwashed hair. Uh, you know, it's like, who, who wants to be characterized as something? Um, a personalized approach has merit in reducing uh, these unmet needs, but do we have the time to do that? It takes an enormous amount of time to put that together, and we don't have the staff. So can we come up with something like this, perhaps, which, is, which combines these aspects to quickly, it, it requires some work and perhaps putting it together, 
but um, it could for the individual people we're designing for people in, in homes and for staff could perhaps provide a quick update on where we can help people and what works for people. So um, one of the things I'm very excited about, which is why we started acting, is your technique of using these non-invasive scramble uh, videos and audio uh, recording of people doing tasks. And this is one of the things we came up with as, as a possible alternative to, which is a really good basis for co-design, is you have prototypes and you ask people to engage with them. And you see what happens. What do people do? Because if you say to people, do you like to shower? Yeah. But if you say, well, could you simulate how you would have a shower that would be well maybe i'm taking a wrong example here whoa 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 this is my dutch you know being there i'm all in my sauna there no um could you simulate how we're cooking together with our clothes on <laughs> so uh anyway so people are um having uh, this sort of non-invasive scrambled anonymous video for us to look at and what what goes well and where are the issues so if you see people if the cupboards do not have glass um are people looking at spending a lot of time around what if they bend down and they come up with orthostatic hypertension having a fall or or a slip or you know becoming unbalanced so we can see where the issues arise we can analyze that with economists with ot uh, to see how people navigate the space and how they interact. Do they interact at all, for instance, or do they leave it be? And in uh, one of the first meetings, we saw a very good example of this with Alexa and Siri ending up having a conversation with each other, uh, whereas the person with dementia was just trying to turn on the light. And it was a, a very sort of bizarre uh, way of interacting. So um, I'm hoping that uh, the panel, uh, we've had some wonderful discussions about this, can shed more light on that type of a discussion. Thank you so much. Tracy says, I love the Tova Tafel. It is really good. Great. Isn't it? Thank yeah. you. Perhaps while um, Felicity and I are just getting set up, I think you'd better come over here because I don't. I think otherwise the people online won't be able to see us. And and Lauren, if you'd like to, to yeah. jump as well, um, if people have questions for Eve, now would probably be a good time. Just while we're we're getting ourselves set up. So uh, yeah, please go ahead. Thanks. That was that was great. Um, uh, you touched on it in your discussion slide actually, but. Um, uh, thinking about personas, yeah, I mean, they're, 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 they're good for bringing people who are unfamiliar with the concepts up to some degree of speed, aren't they? Um, but um, there's a tendency for them to be stereotyped and, and um, I was get, kind of getting restless about diversity and, and, you know, actually, if you look at the population of people with dementia, it's quite varied. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I think I think you're right. And something that always has made me very uncomfortable, especially because I always wanted to have the discussion with people with dementia yeah. about this. And while we were designing that, it was decided not to do that, not to have that discussion. But um, and I guess because you're making a cartoon of what people really are, and it's done in marketing all the time. Uh, you know, like you have your typical middle-aged person who can afford to buy a Lotus, for instance, you know, wears expensive sunglasses. Uh, that's a type of persona you're designing for. And then when you design the next bit of kit that that person can afford, uh, it should be in that line of things that have been developed before. I think it's always stigmatizing. It, it did help us in the design of the Chris and Sally house where we designed different rooms to really think about who we were designing for. So initially it was like, oh, we're designing for somebody with dementia. I was like, but there's such difference in A, the fluctuations within people and B, at the different stages in the needs that they have. Are we designing for somebody who's bedridden? Or are we designing for somebody who just can't find uh, the plates anymore? You know, it's 
therein lies the difficulty. Yeah, well, for microphone, different matter, which um, we did quite a, a large EU funded project called, um, called MIND, which you're probably aware of, yes. Designing for Dementia, and um, uh, quite a lot of the stages in our journey is, you know, familiar um, from what you're, what you're saying. So we, we did use personas at one stage, we had some kind of capability cards, um, but we also produced some guidelines at the end, which are available yes. on, the, on the MIND website. So I don't know whether you, you've looked uh, at Ma those. Martin talked, talked about it, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. so um, I'd, I'd commend them to anybody who's looking, looking, at, um, uh, looking at design issues. But, you know, we came, we had exactly the same view really, which was the more input you've got genuinely from people with, with dementia, um, the better the product, you know, the better the product was, the, um, the more confident you could be that the thing was going to be usable um, and, um, and and you, we sort of grew within, we had quite a long time to do it, so it's quite nice, but we grew experience within the team about how you'd, what sort of methods you use to run workshops and so forth to, to do the work. Yeah. yeah, I think it's really useful because um, how you approach co-design is is a very complicated issue. Um, I think with people with dementia, we actually found I I I I thought it would be much more difficult than it was. Once we got stuck in and we showed people prototypes, it kind of went by itself. But as you say, you know, the Acti chair was a prime example of this. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's the getting them into the room that's yes. really the hard bit. Once you once you get going, so long as you've got some skill in your team um it's relatively easy but actually yep. getting them in the rooms yep. there are so many barriers and that's kind of a challenging bit really yeah. one of the bits i think uh, franz verheim mentioned was uh people getting out of the house um and and franz verheim from maastricht he, he yeah. i think he was he involved in mind he, i think he was I know, I know, I know, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure but he uh no, he was quite a it was uh, 20. Uh, oh, we're 20. Yeah. yeah. Okay. But Francois Hay did a lot of work on uh, design in the home as well. And he said one, one of the issues is that people spend so much of their time at home and often the carers see it as a massive barrier to get out, either to get somebody ready or it interferes with the activities that they have planned or they are wary of um going out and maybe embarrassing themselves or people getting lost or um so so you're right it's quite difficult um to do that to be sensitive to that and be flexible to to allow mm -hmm. for that mm -hmm. ready? oh maria's question um, yeah. Great. Thank you so much. See you later, Maria.